Okay, so without any further ado, a huge, huge welcome to Dr. Kira Ann Pelican. And it is World Book Day, so it's an absolutely wonderful occasion to talk to Kira Ann because Kira Ann has written this wonderful book, um, The Science of Writing Characters. And tonight we'll be dipping into some of Kira Ann's wonderful advice and learning. So Kira Ann is a storyteller, a writer, an educator. Um, and also a story consultant. And Kira Ann has more than 25 years of experience in the uh, film and TV industry across a number of countries, across the UK, across the States, and also in China. So, very, very warm welcome to you, Kira Ann. Um, just as we sort of kick things off, can you tell us a bit about your creative journey and? where it began and, and how you became the amazing storyteller that you are today. I don't know about that, but yes, absolutely. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's lovely to be here and it's lovely to see so many faces and some of you I've seen online. So again, lovely to meet those connections. Um, so I've always been an avid reader and I, I wrote stories from childhood. Um, I brought a couple of books along today that um, uh, I want to share with you. So um, when I was at school, I, I wrote some stories for Blue Peter and, and uh, won a competition and I was sent these two wonderful, wonderful books. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, Jan Pianowski, who um, very sadly died recently, but he created these fabulous books and I won them in a competition. And that, for me, I think cemented something. They're just gorgeous pop-ups, very wow. much from the 70s. Um, and I, I, you know, I went on writing, um, I then um, uh, took a degree in psychology, but I wanted to move back into something creative. I'd always been interested in photography as well. I went to film school afterwards um, and then embarked on a, a, a career in the film industry in a variety of capacities before I started really missing that writing. So retrained at UCLA um, in the early 2000s in screenwriting and then came back uh, to the UK, was teaching, was writing screenplays, consulting. And then during that process, I increasingly realised that um, there was a lot more that we could learn from psychology that I thought would be really useful to solve some of the problems that I was seeing, uh, you know, that I had in my own writing, but also that I was seeing with many, many writers they shared I think many uh, com I common difficulties and I thought psychology must have better solutions for this um, than some of the other kind of pop psychology ideas we thought. So I then embarked on my PhD, um, uh, wrote the book and that pretty much brings me up to, to date. Wow, fantastic. That's amazing. So um, you mentioned sort of coming across psychology but how did you sort of, how did you realize, or when did you realize that it would be a, a real structure for, for creating and developing characters? So I think it's very clear, everybody knows that we of course draw on our intuitive psychology, our common sense psychology when we write characters, we do that instinctively. Um, but it's quite hard to access that uh, and understand why we do things and also to problem solve using just that common sense psychology. So when we run across a problem in our writing, the character's too thin, they're not developed enough, then what do we do about it? So early in my career as a writer, I received some um, wonderful notes from a fantastic script consultant that were very detailed on structure. I remember um, this lady saying there was just something missing with the character they needed more complexity. And I thought that was absolutely right, but also a very frustrating comment at mm. that point because I didn't know what to do with that. Does that mean I just add additional personality traits? Do I give this character deeper flaws? What did that mean? But I had the feeling then that actually there was a lot more that we could learn from psychology that could address ideas like what is complexity in a character? What does that actually mean? How do we better define it rather than saying, just make them all rounded. 
Mm -hmm. um, and we could learn more about relationships so that it could be really useful for writers when they first start writing um, to think about some of those ideas or if they're much more of an intuitive writer and don't like to analyse their characters before they start then um, as a structure to reflect on so then rather than getting notes back from a reader saying there's something missing here mm -hmm. in the same way that we can get very precise notes on potentially structure we should be able to say this is missing. Um, have you thought about, you know, these areas or here are some potential fixes? So that that was really what led me to um, go back and re-examine psychology and, and some more contemporary theories because um, nearly everything we read in books, uh, screenwriting books, writing manuals and so on, is relates to psychoanalytic Freudian Jungian um, psychology mm. and that's been covered endlessly and there's plenty of useful stuff we can take from that but actually in terms of the way psychology is researched taught and practiced today that's a very small part of it it's mostly historical so psychology has moved on a long way since those two yeah. practitioners. Wow and obviously you know I would say and you would probably say read the book <laughs> to find out a bit more about how you know using psychology works and and I've 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 read it I love it and I've also been to one of your um workshops in the past as well and found it incredibly helpful the sort of things that I definitely would not have thought about um but do you have almost like a um <laughs> pocket-sized formula so to speak um that makes characters in your view compelling or psychologically believable so i'm i'm slightly anti-formula um and, and being hugely prescriptive about the way that yeah. i write um i so rather than a formula i i think there are a series of kind of checklists that i would provide mm. starting with um you know in terms of creating a believable character we need to uh, if they're a character we're spending quite a bit of time with longer than a short film for example they need to feel believable and complex and rounded and um we know what that means from psychology we know that that means that they must be shown uh, across five dimensions of personality so i think that's very useful as a start because if you're you can then reflect on a character in a screenplay and and see do, do i have any idea how open they are to experience or do I have any idea how um, conscientious they are maybe these things are just missed out in which case go back and it's a, it's a very easy note to give somebody or to think about yourself um, so we have to have a sense of a consistent a relatively consistent personality we all have um, an idea of who we are we have an idea of who the people we are you know when we meet others we were just chatting you and I were just chatting about Elliot being more extroverted than us earlier on. Elliot, there we go to put you on the spot. Um, so, so it's something that, you know, consistently comes across this, this sense of identity. And, and that, that needs to go down that page. Otherwise, we don't get an idea of who a character is. So that's one aspect, this stable idea of, of personality. And yet personality is also fascinating because actually we behave in a whole variety of different ways. And Jenny and I were both saying, that um, we're slightly more introverted, but have to act in many ways in, in you know, in, in more extroverted fashion at work and so on. And depending on the environment that we're in, I'm, I'm usually much quieter than this. Um, so because I'm in this environment, this, you know, makes me much more chatty and uh, uh, act in a more extroverted way than I usually would. So when we're thinking about our characters, they also need to adapt in realistic ways to the situation we're in. So we need to think about context um, and your characters need to uh, show those variety of differences according to the context they're in. And then also sometimes characters are uh, you know, most interesting when they act completely out of character. That could be fascinating. So why are they acting out of character? It needs to be believable. And that's really compelling to watch when we see a character that we thought was like this suddenly behave in a very very different way um completely out of character and yet it's believable um one of the things that i talk about in the book and also in my my talks um is that um uh um uh, uh one of the notes about from from ian forster uh, uh 
was that characters need to keep on engaging us as, as we read turn the pages of the novel. And um, one of the ways they do that is you know, continuing to surprise us, but it must be in believable ways. So I think that that surprising but in believable ways is all about finding the right context for them to act out of character, um, bearing in mind that in certain contexts, there will be uh, very rich emotional cues. They'll remember things from their past that um, will, will cause them to, to behave in, in kind of unusual ways. Uh, so that's something else to consider. Um, of course, strengths and weaknesses come through the personality traits. Um, so what are your character's flaws? I, I think that's you know, hugely interesting. We're always interested in, we, we just had a brief chat about backstory earlier, Jenny and I did. Um, we're always interested in trying to understand why people behave the way, we, the way they do and predict their behaviour. And if we can start to see explanations for that in backstory, we, you know, we think we're very clever, we think it's interesting, we think life's more meaningful than it necessarily is. So that's interesting. Um, and then transformation. Most people change under pressure. So showing a character evolve under pressure is, is also important. And then, of course, other aspects like making your character emotionally engaging, really thinking about how are your audience going to relate to your character? Why will they want to watch them in the first place? What's going to draw them in? How do they feel about them? And taking your audience through that rich emotional journey of highs and lows um, to keep them engaged, to keep them surprised, um, to keep them learning um, from that story, because ultimately I think we really do um, subconsciously and unconsciously watch stories and, and engage with stories so that we can learn from them about um you know more about how people behave in real life wow that's uh that's a very useful i think potted history of uh <laughs> of your work and um and what you advise in the, in the book in many ways you mentioned um emotion and the importance of emotion and i know this is something that um, I think Elliot always sort of drums home and, and, and says that, you know, emotion is one of the most important things, you know, your audience, your reader has to be emotionally connected or, you know, really actually, actually be taken along um, with the story, the characters. Um, so what, what do you think is the importance of emotion in, in creating compelling characters? As Elliot has said, it's it's everything. It's absolutely everything. So emotion is engaging the audience in the first place. If they're not engaged, engagement necessarily means emotionally engaged. If they're not engaged, they're switched off. They're out. They're out of there. Yeah. So that starts with um, you know the very first split judgments we're making about that character. Who are they? We're wondering whether how we're going to feel about them. Um, if they feel like more of a trustworthy character, we're looking to sympathise with them. To care about them so that they're, they're I think we need to ask the conscious questions of, of why should we care about them what is sympathetic about them what do we like about them mm. but that's of course only one way to relate to a character to start identifying with them um, characters can also be fascinating when we don't feel sympathetically towards them at all mm. um, I'm watching I, I, I don't think it's a particularly good show but I'm what I have to be watching um, is it Inventing Anna on Netflix at the moment? Inventing? Re oh, I, tr I started that the other day and I, I was like, oh, I'm not sure about this. <laughs> okay. I felt exactly the same. And then I came back to it and it's got more interesting. Okay. So the, the Anna Delvey character, so if any of you have been watching it, she's the, the, um, the fraudulent, uh, the, the lady who's pretending to be a, a German heiress in, in New York and defrauded. It's based on a true life story of how she defrauded uh, people of... Um, certainly hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pound, dollars. Um, she's interesting. There's, I find there's nothing sympathetic about her at all, but it's interesting to see how she got away with it. So, you know, characters that we don't um, sympathise with, that we, we instinctively find not trustworthy, we are going to want to learn from. We're going to be fascinated by them. We would have, when we were, you know, first evolving in, in tribes in the, the Stone Age period, we would have been watching those characters and trying to predict and learn from them what's going to happen next. We're all human prediction uh, machines. So when we come across somebody that we don't know what they're going to do next, that really bothers us and really gets our interest. It can be really disturbing. 
Um, so with her, I like, how did she get away with that? That's so interesting. I'm, I, I still feel I'm, 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 I'm not crazy about the show. I have to say, but I'm interested enough in her and how she pulled that off and why actually more than that, why she pulled it off. Um, why she did all of that to keep watching. So that's the other form of emotional engagement. And then of course, from there, we, you know, in terms of keeping an audience um, engaged, it's it's creating very rich emotional experience for them. And one of the exercises that I've done sometimes at Rain Dance with students is to just to get them to reflect on their morning or their day and how many emotions they felt, even during lockdown at home. And it's not just a question of happiness and sadness. They will probably have felt, you know, moments of disgust. Maybe they opened the fridge and there was nothing in it that appealed to them. Um, maybe they felt moments of, of shame when they got an email back that was a little bit critical about their work. Um, I'm sure they found, found a few moments of pride. So we have these very, actually really quite rich emotional experiences, even the most boring of days at home. And we have to compete with that when we tell stories. We've got to grab audiences away from those, that, that, that rich emotional experience we have in everyday lives and make it even richer. Um, and of course, the more attention grabbing it is, um, if that's your, you know, the, the Netflix fair is, is, is all about creating those peaks and troughs of emotion, that roller coaster of emotion um, to really keep the audience engaged. Actually, there's been some re some interesting research by um, a couple of uh, um, a, a research in Washington State and a former Penguin publisher who were looking at this in novels, um, and they published the results in a book called the is it the bestseller code or the blockbuster code? No, it must be the bestseller code. And um, they and I, I also interviewed him for my book, and they they talk about how um, bestseller New York Times bestsellers really follow very rhythmic peaks and troughs of emotions so the the protagonist goes through you know very rhythmic highs and lows um to create these page turners and this is what all those page turners have in common and um i, I just think that's that's absolutely fascinating of course it's not everybody's intention to try and create a page turner like that as, as writers there are many different styles of of prose and, and, and um, novels that we can create but um, it's interesting, I think, to, to think about that. Absolutely. Um, do you think that, I mean, obviously your, your, your book is very much focused around um, writing characters and, and um, developing them. Um, do, you, do you think that it's as important, if not more important, perhaps, than story structure? I do, I do. I, I, you know, we don't have, chats after films that we've watched about the structure unless it's very different and bearing in mind that um we engage with characters so but bearing in mind that in the us 80 percent of films that are made um make absolutely no profit at all at the box office and the vast majority of those will be with classical three act or five act structure same thing three act five act mm. clearly structure alone is not enough to make a film work and engage its audience characters are the things that we engage with they're the, they're the elements that we remember so um that's why i'm you know still slightly bemused about how many books and how much how much we stress structure i, I think it's very useful and very important um but there are many different ways of telling a story and the western way has uh, been dominated by you know this conventional three slash five act structure it's just one form of, of storytelling. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I agree with you. And I think I'd even maybe be slightly controversial and go a bit further to ask you that, you know, if you do develop those characters that are so strong, they almost have a life of their own. And, you know, perhaps in a way they almost create a story structure or, or drive that forward. And it doesn't have to rely on the hero's journey or any other alternative that's already been written out before. I, I completely agree. I, I completely agree. And I think we also see those ideas explored in literary fiction, but I think it will be very possible to create page turners as well. Um, we, clearly we need, you know, uh, we, we need highs and lows of emotions, but th there's no reason why we need certain things to happen on certain pages. Mm. Um, 
and, and, and to always follow that, that, that redemptive story or, or nearly always follow that redemptive story that we see everywhere. It works, it's a, when I say it works, it works for some, you know, well-written uh, um, uh, novels and films, yes. um, but, but it's, it's not enough. So. No, it's, it feels a bit too predictable. It's like you know what's coming and you know when it's coming. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, yeah. Are you, are you working with it in, in your book? So um, the way Anjali and I have written Consequences, it basically doesn't follow any rules, doesn't follow any structure. And in fact, it is quite, um, if anything, it's quite surrealist. Um, and the characters have sort of taken on um, a life of their own and almost they've almost written themselves. Um, so we didn't plan it, um, which is why the editing of it is, is, is quite a piece of work because of the way we wrote it, but we let them sort of get carried away with themselves. Um, so it's very unusual. It, it definitely breaks probably all rules. <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> quite how readable it will be, I'm not sure, but um, it certainly will be different, that's for sure. Oh, interesting, fantastic. Yeah. So when um, when it comes to the writing process, Kira Ann, how how do you actually use um, psychology and and the framework that you've developed, kind of through the through the creative process? So initially, you know, dreaming up the characters, and then the first draft, the second draft. How 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 can it be used throughout those different stages? Okay, great question. So um, some people have told me that they like using the, the frameworks that I suggest from the very beginning. They find it useful in, in planning characters, thinking about ideas, brainstorming new characters. Um, but other people who prefer to write more intuitively, maybe they have a quite a strong idea of their character already in their head, they've spent some time with them. Uh, prefer to you know right away get that first draft down and then reflect on that work using the tools that I've outlined in the book um, which can solve problems like you know why is my character not complex enough why are they not engaging enough why are these relationships not working why are they, are they not interesting why does my character become uh, less engaging at this particular point why don't people believe my character why is my character bland and so on so um, you know, if it's not something that appeals to you because you're a very intuitive writer at first, then I would suggest, you know, maybe take another look and see whether this could be something that you'd find useful um, for analysis and reflection mm -hmm. after you've written a, a draft or, or even a treatment. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And then again, I guess for, um, you know, for that kind of final editing where you think that there's bits missing, you could probably just fill in or, you know, go through those different, um, like you mentioned, the five, um, uh, can't remember what it was. Five dimensions, of personality. five dimensions, yeah. So yeah. just sort of filling in bits that are missing, I guess, as you go through, yeah. Absolutely. I'd love to hear how other people in the audience, how do they, how do you work with your, your characters? How do you develop your characters? And um, are you quite analytical about it? Or do you prefer to save that analysis for a later draft, reflecting, you know, reflecting on a later draft? Please do either put it in the chat or, or unmute yourself and feel free to speak. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, Randy chiming in here. Yeah, I'd like to say that, you know, mostly with my characters, I do a bit of analysis at the beginning, but I recognize that until I actually test them, put them in situations, let them interact with each other, I'm never truly going to understand who they are. And so it's it's both a sort of, you know, as, as I joked in, in the chat, it's like, you know, the outline, the structure is something I've created. The story is what the characters tell me it is. Because it's, I, you know, for me, it's very much about letting the characters express themselves, letting the characters hide things from me and surprise me. Um, you know, I've, I've written a murder thriller and did not know who the killer was for about two thirds of the screenplay as I was typing it. Um, and that's just, I, I like those organic moments, but I realize there's also sometimes where you, you know, you do have to sit there and go in the rewrite phase, 
how can this be better? How can this be stronger? So, you know, just to, to plug your book, it's a phenomenal read and it's a great reference to go back to time and again, um, because you do sort of help turn on that light switch every now and again. Thank you. That, and I think that's fascinating as well. I, I think the process of, um, you know, starting to hear characters' voices in our head is so interesting. And it, it seems to be about, you know, spending a, a, enough time with a character that we internalise them and they, they, they start having agency in our minds. And that, that is such a fascinating psychological process, isn't it? Obviously akin to acting, I imagine. Um, how do other people do this? How do you develop your characters? Hi there, Hi. from across the pond. Um, uh, typically, uh, I have an idea, a rough outline of what I want. Um, they're kind of their arc to be. Um, but then what I'm finding is, as I'm writing it, um, much akin to what the previous uh, feedback was, um, the voice becomes a little bit more clearer, especially as you put them in different situations and you start to think about, um, the dialogue expressing um, more than just, um, you know, reactions or um, like pretty obvious things. So that's kind of where I'm at on it. Pretty interesting. I can submit my own opinion. <clears throat> I often will put a character with two or three different character traits on our, the Rain Dance social media to see who gets the most likes. I know that demonstrates that not only my characters, but myself have delusions of grandeur. But it's, very, <laughs> but it's something that I learned from you, Kira, and how you know that certain sorts of character types get better responses on social media. It, it's fascinating to see that, isn't it? I'm, I'm always looking at the, my, my, on my, my Instagram page at the moment and seeing which characters you know, are getting the most likes and wondering whether that's about more people being on that, online that day or, or something really resonating right now. Um, so I noticed that Rick from Casablanca, who I posted on there this morning, is really not very popular at the moment, but Mayor of Easttown, hugely popular. Um, oh, the lady from Hacks, uh, begins with a J, the main character from Hacks, she was extremely popular. It's fascinating, really, really interesting. I noticed you had Miles on from Sideways. That's one of my favourite characters, Sarah. <laughs> oh, he's lovely, isn't he? Absolutely. Great Wonderful. writers. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody else want to comment on, on their character writing before we move on? Did we have somebody in the chat saying? Knowing the character motivation, imagining their internal psychological oh, spaces, yeah. and then writing situations for them. So Olga, that's that seems to sound similar to um, some of the things that Randall has said. Yeah. Interesting. So moving on to um, backstory, um, Kira Ann, which which you mentioned earlier. I mean, this is something that um, Anjali, I don't, I don't know if you want to come on and talk to it, Anjali, but uh, Anjali and I have, have fed into our work. It was quite an important backstory um, about the characters and, and the, you know, the reasons why they are um, the way they are and what they do. Um, you know, have you got any tips for, for how backstory can be weaved into um, writing and why this is important? So without, and obviously it can be done in a variety of different ways. It can, we can hear about a character's backstory from another character. We can, they can learn more about their own backstory. So there are a variety of different techniques. But in terms of when that backstory is most likely to come up for the character, so potentially using flashbacks, um, then, um, then. I, the, the, the most believable ways of doing that uh, and arguably therefore the most emotionally truthful and compelling ways of doing that will be to uh, um, to find the right clearly to find the right scenes to reveal this but when the, the, the times when will those memories would most likely be triggered will be when they are um, emotionally salient 
and sometimes revisiting a place. So places are, and, and smells, smells we don't do in film, but smells we do in novels potentially, um, are huge triggers of memory. Um, and also changing time. So if we're under a lot of pressure, if we're under a lot of pressure and we revisit a scene where something difficult happened, um, we are likely to have those emotional triggers. So something may um, you know, re-emerge at that point. Or if we're with somebody that uh, reminds us of an incident from childhood, for example, then that can be another emotional trigger. But it, it's all about um, you know, the, the, the most plausible and therefore truthful, and I would say engaging compelling flashbacks will be triggered by, um, by a scene, by the situation. So you know, finding the right time for that um yeah does that is that remote yeah it, is it, that it, very it, obvious no no that is helpful and i guess it, it it also sort of you know explains explains why the way they they are the way they are and it's it's kind of linking that isn't it so linking the backstory to those various different um psychological traits that they have so yeah i think that's yeah. really helpful um yeah. I was just going to add about backstory because when, uh, as Jenny said earlier, we wrote the characters and the, we didn't have a backstory. We had to go get write one, so we just basically um, said they were brought up in France, and then that started us off on a new path, really. So yeah, and <laughs> it worked though. It did work. And, and psychological end. trauma from when they were younger as yeah. well. Um, yeah, we had to put that in. Quite intense yeah. psychological trauma. Yeah. Um, but it's sure. kind of become a lot bigger than it was, hasn't it, Anjali? That, yeah. Yeah. It was in the now and we didn't really have a past for them. They just came out of nowhere. <laughs> well, that was very difficult. <laughs> but that's interesting because that you, you presumably got to a point where you where you were looking for explanations as writers. And, and I think it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I listened to a really interesting lecture by a psychiatrist who specialises in memory the other day. And she was pointing out that um, psychological theory for many years, um, uh, you know, w uh, w uh, um, uh, you know, strongly argued the case that we were blank slates and that everything that, um, you know, the way that we are is com completely explained by our backstory. But of course, psychiatrists know that actually we're not blank slates um, and uh, we come with a genetic inheritance and environmental factors also shape our brains as well. Um, but as writers, that's not interesting. As writers, we want to make meaning from the world. So we don't want to understand characters in terms of, um, you know, something biological going on in the brain. That's a lot less interesting, unless we're exploring ideas around that. Generally, we want to understand why people are because of the events that have happened to them. And we look back to make those connections and we find them interesting and it helps us make life more meaningful uh, so I think it's fascinating um, I think I think I think you know I think also thinking about traits and it's something that I've thought about more actually since writing the book so it's not in if I rewrote the book now I would add a big chunky section on writing from the floor um, but I think that um, you know thinking about those events that have shaped us that have created flawed beliefs about the world um, at, that, that continue to guide us, that also shape our, they shape our needs, they shape our goals, um, and they shape our emotions as well, because we, you know, there may have been a situation that made us ashamed. And so we didn't want to have to deal with that again. So we hide away from things, um, or maybe it made us aggressive. So, so the emotions that have also come out or, or potentially of, of um, that backstory and continue to guide us, I think are fascinating. I, I was using an example recently in something that I was teaching um, relating to backstory and, and breaking bad. Um, and there are a couple of things there. Uh, so Walter White, of course, his most recent backstory is that he, he was uh, ripped off by his former business partners and he, you know, he felt uh, uh, ashamed and frustrated by that. And, you know, never wants to, to feel that again. So he wants to be the most powerful because of that. But also in a later season, he talks about his father and he talks about watching his father who was dying of a uh, um, uh, a terminal illness. Maybe it was Huntington, Huntington's disease. And he, he describes how he was rattling around in his shell and he never wants his, his family to have to, to see him be like that. And then meanwhile, he's driving around with the live free or die um, 
number plate. So he, you know, his his belief is, I've got to live freely. I'm never going to let somebody, uh, um, you know, pin me down. I've got to be the most I possibly can be. And it all comes back from these two elements of backstory. This having seen, first of all, his father. I suspect some of this was written in later. Um, but uh, um, having seen his father dying and, and trapped in his body and unable to live freely when he was a child and then later experiencing, you know, being ripped off and then wanting to ne never to let that happen to him again. So he goes from shame to excessive pride um, and arrogance and that emotional path, as well as the traits that go along with it, um, the arrogance, the callousness and so on. Um, you know, really drive that backstory. And I think it's, and, and, and the belief, that, and I think that's fascinating and does that add reality and depth to that character. Yeah, that's a really helpful example. Probably one that lots of people here have seen as well, I would imagine. <laughs> and just moving on to something that I know from, from the various sessions that we've had here at CoLab, people have, have said that they often struggle with dialogue. How do you think that, um, personality or character can actually help us to write good dialogue uh, well there is I, so our dialogue is, is so much shaped by our personality i think it's fascinating so in the book i um i have a series of tables and i should, i i i've drawn on um a whole bunch of research from from linguists studying the difference between uh, uh people that are or one end of the spectrum of personality and others so introverts versus extroverts um people that are more conscientious versus unconscientious and there, there are huge differences in um in the way that we speak in in terms of uh, that, that really uh, relay our personality so extroverts for example and we can listen to elliot more closely next time he speaks um they 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 they, they talk a lot they chat away they go from topic to topic they tend to be more upbeat and dynamic in conversation. They tend to use much more casual and colloquial language compared with um, introverts. And, um, you know, there are these huge differences. Introverts tend to be much more formal. Obviously, they speak less. Um, but we see huge differences in not just the content of, of the things that people talk about, um, but also their style, their fluency. And I think that is super useful for people that maybe aren't as good naturally at writing dialogue. We all have our strengths and weaknesses as writers. If you're not great at writing dialogue, that's fine, but it, you know, don't rule yourself out of the game because there are just some great, uh, you know, very useful and applicable ideas here that you can take and, and, and work into your characters and you're gonna be immediately expressing lots more personality by doing that. So I, I think that's interesting. And that leads me on to the, the topic of writer's voice and writing first person narrative. Shall I go into that or shall I stop? Yeah, please do, please do. Okay. So I think that's also interesting for novelists uh, when, you're, when you're writing um, first person narration, um, because of course that's again about conveying a character's voice. Um, and when I've taught this recently to novelists, I've used the example of Amy Dunn from Gone Girl and and you know she speaks in a very peppy fashion she's a she she she's an extrovert obviously she, actually in, in in gone girl she's um you know she's faking those diaries isn't she she's writing them but but she she it's very casual language it's very upbeat fun um language it's very much the language we see it there in the novel in that in that narration it's the, the language of a dialogue of a dialogue of an extrovert um so Again, that's fascinating. Thinking about the voice that you're using if you're writing a novel, that and, and you're you're a narrator. Um, if you're a third person, if you're writing it in the third person, or if you're writing the third person, um, actually, it's telling us a lot about the personality of the narrator, and and maybe that's something you're you know you're doing brilliantly already instinctively. But if not, I think there are these useful additional tools that we can draw on that may help you know some writers uh, uh uh kind of do that better that's incredibly helpful um i'm going to sort of put you on the spot a bit kieran if you don't mind and ask if you could talk us through one or two of your favorite characters from from movies or or tv series 
um, that you find particularly compelling? Um, and if you could just um, tell us a little bit about why, why they're compelling, I guess, in your eyes. OK, so I'm going to first of all say I have massive near sight bias when I'm when I'm thinking about something that I've loved. Um, so it tends to be whatever I've been watching most recently that I've really engaged with. Um, and of the series of the TV series that I've watched over the last year, um, uh, Mayor of Easttown is one of the characters that I've I've loved, uh, I've most enjoyed. Um, and also I've loved um, so I'll talk about Mayor, and then also uh, the um, Jennifer Coolidge character in, in White Lotus. I really enjoyed her as well. But Mayor of Easttown, um, she she felt very real to me. She felt uh, beautifully portrayed. I identified with her. Um, she is. Uh, um, I very much identified with her. She kind of she's hardworking. She gets on with it. She just keeps. Uh, um, I, 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 I identify with many ways. I think she was just beautifully drawn. I think the details in that show, the sense of place, the sense of characters were all really helped make it um, feel something very real and emotionally truthful and engaging. Um, and given that it was a crime drama, that, that felt all, all of that, everything from the characterization through the sense of place and storylines just felt very well um, researched. Tremaine, I'm I'm pleased you agree with me. What did you, did you, you enjoyed her as well? What did you, did even you, as a yeah. male? Uh, oh, <laughs> it's Sorry. okay. You I go ahead. Over you. No, you go first. No, that's okay. Uh, I didn't expect to be put on the spot like that, but um, yeah, I, it, it was great to see um, Kate, Kate Winslet in such a, a different role as well. That's all I was going to she say, was really. She but was um, yeah. I lost sight of who who she was, and people commended her on her accent as well. Brian, yeah, she was a. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was I was just going to add. Even as a man, I I her human qualities. I think were what. I mean, that's I think the goal. Um, when I'm writing a character is to write a character that feels human because I connected to her on all the levels you talked about as well, but obviously I'm not a woman and I, um, but she's such a compelling character. Uh, I'm just on so many levels um, as were well the rest. So I just want to add that. So. So, so that's so interesting, isn't it? That we can identify ac across gender. It, be it becomes irrelevant. Um, would you say, would you say would you say connect or would you go as far to say as identify with or is that taking it too far? Oh, identify for sure. I mean, sure, yeah. the situations she was in were so well written, and not all of us are solving murders or are a, a, a cop in a small industrial town, but the human part of her character, the, the connection points, I guess, is to her character allowed us whoever you are to connect with her on some level as of experiencing just the slightest bit of maybe some of the things she was. I completely agree. Has anybody watched it and not enjoyed it? Which is obviously valid and, and be interesting. Right. No. <laughs> So, and the other character I was going to mention, um, and this one, it, she, she's just, it's just much harder for me to justify why. And I think it was part of loving the whole show uh, during lockdown. So this is the White Lotus um, and the um, uh, a Tanya McCoy character, Jennifer Coolidge. Um, I thought she was utterly wonderful. Again, she, she was, she, she was just very convincing, very human, very flawed. Um, I found her quite fascinating as well. Um, she, I didn't identify with her, but she, she's certainly a sympathetic, very flawed character. And, and she, was, she was really interesting. Is that Alison agreeing with Mayor of East Town or with uh, uh, um, the Jennifer Coolidge character? I can't quite see. East, oh, East Town, yep. Yeah. Who's seen The White Lotus? 
Oh, I thought it was wonderful. I would recommend it. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. Be adding that to my list. <laughs> Jenny, would it, can I can I put you on the spot and ask what you've enjoyed relatively recent in, in novels or film, TV? Um, okay, I'm going. It's probably going to show how shallow I am. <laughs> I'm sure not. But I have been I have been watching um, and really enjoying Emily in Paris. Um, and even though it's quite sort of, you know, teenage in many ways, um, I just think it's, I just think it's so well done. Um, having lived in France myself, um, I just think, I, you know, couldn't have written any better, well, obviously, because it's well written. Um, but I just love it. Absolutely love it. I think that's so interesting. So I, 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 I did want to watch it and then I read some reviews and was put off it. Ah. Um, and then I, it, it seems to have... <laughs> People are talking about it more and it seems to have got better ratings. I, know I may go back and take a look in that case. Is, yeah. I presume it's quite escapist. Upbeat. Oh, it, it totally is. It's amazing. And then the other one is I've completely forgotten the name of is actually a French series written by um, Fanny Herrero, which I've completely forgotten the name of. Not Call My um, Agent, no. Yes, Call My oh. Agent. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that was wonderful. So yeah. I just, I love so many of the characters in that. I just think it's genius. Absolutely. I, I, actually, now I'm thinking about that, that would definitely go there in, in the recent list. You're absolutely right. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, there's things like um, some of the characters from Schitt's Creek and that sort of thing, but that was kind of early on in the pandemic for me. So probably yeah. the other two um, are more present for me. Um, Sarah's got a question here. Um, Sarah, feel free to ask it yourself if you like. Hi, hello. Hi, um, nice to be here. Um, I've just got a question. Um, jumping from screenwriting, I haven't really written a novel fully yet, uh, but just jumping, I just want some advice from going from screenwriting into writing a novel. Like, I know that's quite a broad question, but I just would like some advice on sort of uh, characterization and um, this is a psychological kind of, not a thriller even. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen like the movie Lamb, but it's kind of in that, that sort of um I'll just give you a rundown about a little bit what it's about but um it's the novel that I wish to write is called Deer it's about a lady who has a pet deer and um a hunter from her neighboring property actually kills her pet deer um anyway um so what happens is we see the characters um change they're very flawed characters to begin with um, mainly the hunter that kills the deer but so I want to write this as a novel so I can turn it into a screenplay. Um, and I was just wondering how, how best to go about sort of what resources I could use switching from screen, like what would help me. I know I just need to sit down and write it, obviously, but I just, I just want some advice on going from screenwriting, which I've done for the last couple of years, to, to, to novel writing. Yeah, if that's... So I've only, yes. just, I've only started doing that personally myself. So I've just started writing okay. my first novel. Um, oh. I'm writing in the, um, I'm writing uh, uh, in the first person, which, um, mm -hmm. which I'm really, really enjoying actually. So I, I think first of all, thinking about voice, you know, whose point of view is this? I'm making that mm -hmm. decision. Mm. Um, I suspect you're, you're, we're going to be spending potentially a lot longer with characters um, even than we would in a feature film so you're probably going to need to know them even even more so I think that's about you know really mm. making sure that you understand who they are and you can hear their voices before you start mm -hmm. writing mm -hmm. and I think that's often about you know spending time with them workshopping in your head until you hear their voices oh, do you know whether you're writing the first person or, or third person yet as, so that's a question um so first person is is writing from your own view is that is it yeah from the characters but yeah from your own view yeah oh right um yeah so i i think 
I think that might work. I think that might work actually, um, because um, I might have to do a bit of research <laughs> on that because um, I'm I'm kind of out of touch with that kind of style, you know, novel writing, long form writing, rather than you know just ninety page features and things like that. But yeah, so so would so I'd need to have a clear idea of of the first person or third person. So the third person is when the characters are, are telling their story, aren't they? Yeah. Both, yeah, first person the characters are telling the story, third person um, describing from more of a distance. But oh, actually yeah. there's something to look up. If you do that, you should also, I won't talk about it now, but there's there's something mm -hmm. to look up which is called psychic distance that's quite interesting. Oh, um, psychic distance. Okay. Oh, that sounds very interesting. Right writing the third person, that's a way of getting closer to the characters in, in a novel. Um, and you can, right. you can move in through layers. It's really, really interesting. I think as a screenwriter coming to it, to, to look at that, it's like zooming in with a lens. Okay, so it's um, called psychic, psychic. Psychic distance. And I think that the person that originated that idea was John Gardner. So but if you Google psychic oh. distance novels, you'll okay. find quite a bit of useful stuff on it that's, that's fascinating. Oh, fantastic. Yes, because this is going to be quite psychological, um, delving into their complete flaws and, yeah, just quite, it's, it, the deer does not come back as a scary, you know, monster type deer, but it comes back as some sort of um, almost kind of godlike um, sort of symbol to change this hunter's viewpoint. So you'll see a change in him. From going to, from being a, a hunter without um, a conscience to yeah so okay distance psychic distance thank you <laughs> Get it? yeah thank you who, who uses one. that technique great no, that's great who, you. who likes using psychic are you, are you mostly novelists or screenwriters or a mixture here it's a real mixture actually it's a real mixture you yeah okay yeah. yeah. That's very interesting. That almost sounds like a spirit animal type thing, Sarah. I like that. Oh, yeah, it's it's I actually it's based on like a true story that sort of happened here in New Zealand. I um, but I just I just I I need something that's a bit more after screenwriting for so long. I thought it would be a good exercise just to be able to write some sort of novel. Um, 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 and just simply call it dear but you know once I, I go into it that's when I'll be um, sort of have have this um, like take uh, Kara's advice on um, getting really into the characters and um, getting inside their heads but yeah the, so, sort of the animal comes back as sort of sort of um, not not scary but it will have links to sort of um, Pan or Kurninos, um but but also um, just the carrot. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. So I can't wait to, to get into it. <laughs> so thank you, Jenny. <laughs> welcome. You're welcome. I'm just having a look at, well, trying to find um, some of the questions in the chat. And there's one from Charles um, asking about screenwriting for short films, how to best capture the authentic depth of character in, a sh in such a short runtime. Okay, great question you're not going to capture that much depth in a short film. So it, it, it's going to be, you know, partly down to the writer, partly down to the performances and directions and the casting that, that that's going to add another huge dimension to it. Um, so if you're writing, directing, then that's great. You'll have control of, of both of those things. If not, then you work with a great director and, just, and, and wonderful, uh, um, you know, talent. Can I just give one little piece of advice for that person who's trying to characterize them? Um, I always give the characters in a short film some sort of um, sort of quirk, sort of um, even if it's like they've got a scar on their face or I know that doesn't mean much, but um, it might be the way they look at someone or um, but yeah, sorry, I just wanted yeah. No, look, so look is, it look is incredibly hard look, to... is, look, look, look is really really interesting we we can read three out of five dimensions from a static mm. face so um <laughs> so you know sarah looking at your headshot if we were to ask everybody here to try and work out your personality just from your headshot right um, <laughs> they'd probably start to get it right actually and then the longer that we spend with somebody um we tend to just confirm the judgments we've already made about them from from that a split second decision. 
So that's interesting right. and, and really interesting yeah. thinking about it in relation to actors and casting because it, it clearly brings so much. But but mm. also, yeah, strong traits, short films, strong traits. What are the, you know, just focus on what are the characters' strongest traits and bring them out. Um, mm. Sorry, I was just distracted by somebody who'd written edgy creative. So we don't need to do that in the text. We don't need to do that in the chat to, to, to rate poor Sarah's personality on there. <laughs> Might be the nose ring. Might be the nose ring. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and actually concrete details as well that's another thing so if you've got um concrete details are always useful and interesting and, and, and make characters feel more believable so if you've got a highly disagreeable character they're going to be opinionated but think about what those opinions are what what is it what do they have opinions about is it do they always argue about food do they what specific things do they like or not like give them some concrete opinions if they're disagreeable um, if they are, uh, you know, close to experience, close minded, what don't they like? What are the things that they really object to? So honing in on those specific beliefs um, can be super, super useful. Does anybody else have any questions at all? Aha. So Afnan has one, which is what kinds of characters or fiction um, are generally narrated in the first or third person? Are there any general rules? That's a very interesting question. I don't think there are any, but um, I find that a really interesting question. So I, I've, I feel like I've read a well, I certainly have read a whole variety of different characters from introverts, extroverts, all across the spectrum um, in in both first and third i can i can think about examples um off the top of my head so i don't think there are any trends i think it's uh, sometimes in, in terms of making that decision um you, you, obviously you've got to do what's best for the story there may be specific reasons why we need to see um, a story told from different points of view maybe people disagree about the events that happen maybe we need to uh, you know maybe we have an unreliable narrator it's one of the characters Clearly that happens all the time in um, psychological thrillers, um, which is why they're written in, in, in the first person generally, um, possibly always. No, I'm going to say generally, um, so that a character can lie and, and, and that's, that keeps us intrigued. Um, but there are other times when we want the narrator to be more omniscient um so that we can get a you know a, a, a very different perspective oh emma darwin so sarah's just popped in yeah emma darwin's mm -hmm. she's a she's got some fantastic uh, um content so look out for her comments on this absolutely she's she really writes some great uh, um stuff on writing very useful to follow fantastic thank you <laughs> yeah i'll look her up also, just um, going back to something that Greg had said in the chat earlier, um, apparently um, the main hits in the US have always been, um, songs have always been written from the first person. So it sounds like that's true for um, songwriting as well, which is interesting. It's really interesting. Really, really interesting. Fascinating. Swati Money Heist. Ah. I haven't seen it. Should I have seen it? Yes. Tell me why. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, the characters is what, uh, you know, it really drove. The story was there, the structure, everything was there, but the characters were just so, so compelling. I mean, and uh, I think, um, you know, the, uh, my question also uh, mentioned that, that all the characters were named on city names, like, you know, Rio, Tokyo and all that. So that really helped in, you know, increasing the recall factor. And uh, so it was easy for people to remember the names and uh, that helped them in engaging more with the characters. Mm. So somewhere they matched the character personality with, an essence uh, of that particular city for which they were naming the characters. That was a, that was a very interesting thing. Oh, that what an interesting comment. Yeah. I'm just reading through the other comments here. Yeah, that's what. <laughs> 
if anybody wants to um, ask Kira Ann anything, then now is your chance. Um, but in the meantime, Kira Ann, it might be worth telling people about your um, character masterclass um, and what, what people may um, hope to expect um, later in the spring. Yes, uh, so at the moment I just have an Instagram feed and if you are, um, if you're uh, uh, um, working on character introductions in screenplays then I'm posting at the moment a, a couple of character introductions from films and TV series every day. Um, so that, that, you know, that may be a useful resource. Um, and my plan is, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm also writing a longer course um, that will take you through a longer video based course, but I'll also provide some uh, feedback to every writer. Um, thank you, Randall. Um, uh, you know, taking you from the very, very first stages of developing a character through to the final stages. So really, you know, drawing on all my resources and, and, and allowing you to workshop your character from the very, very beginning to getting them down on the page working through any problems and so on and so that's my most comprehensive um course yet and then i've got a rain dance uh, um lockdown coming up on march the 14th possibly 14th maybe i should have i meant to check that just before but there's a, 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 a lockdown course that i'm very much looking forward to in a couple of weeks yeah. courtesy valley thank you very much wonderful and um, yes, Instagram's um, actually quite interesting. I, I was avoiding Instagram for a very long time. Um, and it's, it, I mean, there is some obviously quite moronic content on there as well, but you can, there's quite an interesting writing community too. I yeah. Say, if anybody has any personal, if any, you know, questions about your character that you're developing, I'm very happy to answer specific questions or. Um, I don't have a specific question about a story, but I'm I'm really intrigued about lying. And um, uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> now let me are, just finish this sentence here. <laughs> Considering how much people lie, not just in a malicious sense, but every day we lie to ourselves. That person really likes me, or this, you know, the the because we're very complex, extremely most complex computers on the planet, but we also rely on lies to um, support our ego, to support our reality, our version of our world. So what do you think are, it's just at the moment, you've made me very interested in lying and lying characters and the, the type of framework is most common for good liars. What's, well, who's your favorite liar character that's like, absolutely amazing liar because I do think Breaking Bad is like one of the most complex incredible characters but there's so much lying and in delusions that go on in his own world but do you have another couple characters that you enjoy for their because there's always an assumption why should we have all these characters telling the truth all the time telling us everything do you know what I mean like do you have some characters who are fucking amazing liars well, well the, the 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 one that comes straight to mind is the talent of mr ripley yeah so and, and i think that's both the film and the novel are, are, the novels uh, um are, are, are worth reading so i think he's an absolutely and utterly fascinating character we are really interested in liars we're going to be compelled you know it's just such an engaging thing to write about and i think the interesting thing to there if you're if you're writing if you're creating a, a liar as a character is that your audience your readers will will want to learn that what they're trying to do is they're trying to learn something from that novel or something from that TV series that will inform them next time they yeah. are with a liar. So any any insights that you can give your readers into how the mind of a liar works are going to be fascinating. So, so it's just really compelling. Well, why do we like liars so much? I was just before the class here tonight, Kieran, congratulations, it's wonderful. And thank you, Jenny. I was looking, <clears throat> At a Russian interview of their spokesperson about the Ukraine war. And the interviewer was saying, have you just aimed badly or did you actually try to do that? She said, there's a third reason. This was staged by the Ukrainian army to make us look, make us Russians look shit. And it just sank a dagger in my heart, but I will never forget that. And was wondering what 
insight you can do on the psychology of lying because when we see a liar and we know what the lie is it just is so powerful isn't it so so i so i, I maybe there are two questions that come out of that it's, it is so powerful i i think you know why are we so interested in watching liars um as audience members as readers and then secondly why do people lie um, in terms of why we're interested in watching them, I think we want to learn how to catch them out. We don't get it. So, you know, we, the vast majority of people are truthful. We, as Alison said, of course, we, you know, we, there are a variety of situations we lie in, but ultimately all relationships really function on trust and our, the society we've built up functions on, on trust. So, you know, more often than not, we're, most people are trustworthy and behave in trustworthy ways, which is why it's shocking to us when people lie and we want to, spot them and understand and predict them better so that's part of it and on the other side in terms of why people do lie then um you know i think it goes back to um flaws childhood flaws having learned to deal with situations uh, uh, in a more manipulative fashion um and you know p potentially coming you know having that belief that if i if i you know that that, that i i, I that you, you, it's about not being yourself you can't be yourself so if i pretend to be this then i'm going to be more liked i'm going to i'll, I'll avoid trouble if i am always like this um so i think it's kind of about digging back to the, the 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 flawed beliefs that create those lies in the first place and damaged psyche just you know it's damage that that that, that creates that but but it's so fascinating that's and really helpful situation. that's really helpful kira and thanks so much and any of you watching it tonight buy her book and study it it's so helpful thank the you. science of writing characters thank you thank you it is amazing and it's also something that you know obviously it's short enough to be able to read through in one go but also it's great to dip into and almost have as like a writing companion um which you can't say of of all writing books if you can see it Thank you. Yeah, it's brilliant. Right. Well, you've been incredibly generous with your time, Kira Ann. Um, does anybody have any last questions for Kira Ann at all? Uh, just one quick one. Oh, well, quick question. God knows how long the answer will be. Um, always interested when I'm working with my characters and I get to know them better. I always find I end up learning a lot about myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering about like any experiences you had in, in looking at this and looking at effort, in ways to apply modern psychological theory and what have you to, to characters maybe you've been working on and what it taught you about yourself. Oh gosh, that, that <laughs> is like an absolute nightmare of a question. And I was just- You're welcome. Jenny, at the <laughs> beginning of this, but how I don't really like talking about myself. Um, no, but I mean, that obviously for many people, that could be a really interesting question to open up many, many. Uh, oh, no, that that's a horror question for me. I, all I'm going to say is that I completely relate to that. And I do understand. I, I think that, the, the you know, the minute you spend any time thinking about any of these ideas, of course, you're going to think, how does my per what is my personality like? Why am I like this? I've got a section in relationships on that book as well. So you reflect on your relationships, the kind of people you're potentially attracted to. Why is that? What, you know, do these things work? Do these things not work? I think it's very natural. And as I watch writers sometimes in classes, and I'm talking through this stuff and I can see, okay, they're not actually thinking about their characters right now. They're just going through, oh my goodness, that's me. <laughs> that's horrific. <laughs> we work on that. I think it's just very normal that we, that we start thinking about ourselves before our character. So I think it's just part of the process. But Randall, is there something you, you, you want to share about yourself that you've learned? <laughs> um, nothing, nothing that can be recorded and shared with police <laughs> anywhere around the world. No, it, it just always fascinates me that, that, that when I'm creating, there is a breadth of experience that I don't know that I have um and that comes out in the characters or that um the i commented on in the chat earlier about this of, of when i'm working with students or when i'm coaching 
individual writers. It's amazing how well these writers know their characters and don't know that they do. And part of my job as the outsider is to go, oh, did you notice this? Oh, you seem to be saying this. And it, I almost sometimes feel like a psychotherapist uh, because I'm, I'm helping them see things that they don't know they're telling me. That's fascinating. That's really, really interesting. And is that through, yeah, that's presumably through the actions and dialogue of the character yeah. both revealing? Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how often a character will make a sudden or a subtle comment or the writer will have written an act, you know, or, or a reaction to something. And it's like, oh, you know, I'm watching this as an outsider, so I don't have to worry about writing, which is, I think, what distracts everyone when they're trying to write is, oh, my God, I got to write the next thing. So we don't I, I think we're not as aware of what we're writing, that so much of what we're writing is subtextual and subliminal. Um, until somebody else points it out and goes, dude, that's really disturbing, or that's fascinating. Um, and to watch students' faces light up when they realize what they've already written, that's one of the perks of the job. So I'm grateful to Elliot for that, uh, to have that opportunity, you know. Well, that's lovely for your writers as well, isn't it? I, yeah. I think also on, on that note, I think sometimes when you spot, you know, when writing's going really well and characterization's working really well on the page of something you're reading and you point that out and say, I really liked it when your character does this, that more, let's do more of this. Um, or, or, you know, uh, um, that can be very interesting and useful as well. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much again. I think we'll probably bring it to a close, but if anybody wants to hang around for a little bit of um, chatting about what you're working on, then feel free to. Um, but I think we'll, we'll stop the recording now. Um, and thank you so much to our special guest, Kira Ann Pelican on um, World Book Day. Thank you, Kira Ann. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jenny, for bringing me on. It's really been lovely. And just meeting all of you and, and hearing your comments and questions and, and about your characters has been absolutely fantastic. So thank you.